when we spoke about relative addressing, I said that's one of the very few important concepts in Excel. The other very important concept in Excel, of course, is the converse of relative addresses, which is absolute addresses, which we've already discussed. Together, these two lead to a very important topic called isolating assumptions. When you're creating serious spreadsheets, you really have to understand this idea of isolating assumptions very, very clearly. In fact, this is so important that we tell our students all the time, if you don't isolate assumptions, then you fail the course, no matter what else you may have done well in the course. This is that important. Let's try and understand what we mean by isolating assumptions and why it's so important. So consider this formula. This is a formula we wrote to calculate the total cost for each of the people in the last video, in the video on uh, uh, absolute addresses. So here, of course, the number 10 represents the price of an SD card, 16 is the drive of a price of a flash drive, and 15 is the price of a stylus. Right. So this is the formula that we wrote first. And of course, we saw why this formula was not good. Right. So what we, when we write such numbers, actual numbers like 10 and 16 and 15, instead of putting cell addresses, we refer to this as hard coding within a formula. This is just a term we say hard coded. We just use this term to represent the fact of putting actual numbers into formulas. Okay. Uh, why is this dangerous? We already understand that this is dangerous because if you put these kinds of numbers into formulas, uh, there is always a possibility that these numbers may change over time, right? Or you may have entered a number wrong and then you want to correct it. Uh, but if you enter this kind of a number and then you copy this formula to 1000 other cells, then the moment a number changes, then you now have the problem of not only updating the original formula, but also updating, updating the 1000 copies that you have made of it, right? So hard coding numbers like these in formulas makes your spreadsheets very difficult when changes take place, right? So what we'll do is exactly what we did in the earlier lecture, in the lecture on absolute addressing, which is we'll take these numbers, put them into separate cells of their own, and then in these formulas, instead of now referring to the actual numbers, we'll include the absolute address of the corresponding cells. That is really what we mean by saying we are isolating assumptions. So in a sense, in our lecture on absolute addresses, we've already taught you how to isolate assumptions. Okay, so again, we are saying, suppose these prices are used in a thousand formulas. If we want to change the price of an SD card to 12, right? So now we have the problem of changing a thousand formulas. You may say, well, I'm only going to change one formula and then I'm simply going to copy it to all the others. But then there is always a risk associated with that, that you may not copy the new formula to all of the thousand. What if you miss out one? What if you miss out 10, right? Because all of the thousand are not visible on one page. They are in several pages and it's very easily possible that you may have, you may miss out something. Even worse, you may just update one formula and completely forget to change all the others. Then there's a huge problem, right? So these are the insidious ways in which errors creep into spreadsheets. On the other hand, suppose we put these numbers into their own cells and include the absolute address of those cells in the formula, then all you have to do in order to account for a change in price is to change one single number. That's really what we mean by uh, isolating assumptions, okay? And this is what it is. This is just a slide from the previous example itself. So we put the prices into their own cells and then we included the absolute address of those prices in your formulas. Now, when you copy and paste this formula, the absolute address remains unchanged for all of the remaining formulas. And then the moment you change an individual price, because of Excel's automatic recalculation, everything is taken care of, right? So one price change reflect is reflected or taken care of by one single change in your spreadsheet. That's how it's supposed to be. So what we do is when, when you've got numbers, like for example, this 10, 16, and 15, and so on, which potentially affect many different formulas, many different cell formulas, we call them as assumptions, right? They are assumptions because your entire spreadsheet is critically dependent in terms of at least the values in the entire spreadsheet 
are critically dependent on the values of these particular items. Okay, we call them as assumptions. Now, in our per per current example, these prices occur in many different formulas, maybe a thousand formulas, but they are all occurring in copies of the same formula. Okay, even then, it's advantageous to isolate assumptions. But there would be many situations in which the same assumption, namely the price of an SD card, may appear in many structurally different formulas as well. Right in one context, the price of the SD card occurs in computing, let's say, the total cost for Joe or the total cost for a person. But there might also be other places, other formulas in which the same constant, that is the price of an SD card, plays a role. Okay, uh, so uh, assumptions play a very important role in, uh, in the values that a spreadsheet computes. And therefore, isolating the assumptions makes it possible for us to take care of any changes that may occur to these assumptions by changing just a single cell. Okay. Otherwise, we'll have a chaos of having to go and find all the places where this constant uh, is appearing and we may have to go and make all of those changes. We may forget to make some of those changes and your complete spreadsheet will lose its integrity. That becomes really important. So that's why isolating assumptions is a very key idea in spreadsheet design. Okay, so now let's recap. Uh, the, at the core of good spreadsheet design lies understanding relative addresses, understanding absolute addresses, and being able to judiciously use these two kinds of addresses in designing your spreadsheet. Okay, I would say just understanding relative absolute addresses and when to use what really accounts for about 80% of your understanding of how to use a spreadsheet program like Excel. So be sure that you critically, properly, uh, thoroughly understand these two ideas. So in order to isolate assumptions, we place constants or assumptions in their own cells and include their absolute addresses in formulas. That's the essence of isolating assumptions. And this is exactly what we did in our prior examples. So after isolating your assumptions, you will see that your spreadsheets almost never have numeric constants in formulas. Okay, I say almost never, right? Because after all, you need to isolate only those assumptions that are liable to change. Like for example, the price of an SD card, right? Or let's say the hourly salary for a worker. These are things that can change and therefore putting them in their own cells makes, uh, makes a lot of sense. But there are certain other numbers, constants, that are not liable to change. Right? So for example, there are 7 days in a week. There are 24 uh, hours in a day and so on and so forth. Right? These are constants that are unlikely to change. Almost will never change. Right, so you can assume that they are sort of solid. You don't have to isolate them into uh, their own cells. So for example, you can put the number 24 if it represents the number of hours in a day. You can put that into a formula. That's all right, right? Because that is an assumption that will not change, right? So that is why I said almost never have numeric constants in formulas. Okay, so let's do some examples of isolating assumptions. So once again, I've shown only five people here, but by this dot, 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 I'm saying you may have, you know, hundreds of players. Okay. So I'm saying here a basketball league completes, computes a player's quality as five times points plus two times assists. Right. So here you've got each the player names and then you've got the number of points they stored and the number of assists they uh, performed and you want to now write a formula to calculate their uh, quality. Okay, so it's five times points plus two times assists, right? And I'm calling this five and two as the weight given to points and the weight given to assists, right? So a player's total quality is this, this. So the, the assumptions five and two are uh, here. Right? So write a formula in D2 to compute 
this Estrada players, the, the player on row two, that player's quality, and then copy it for all other players, right? And I'm saying here, you're not allowed to write separate formulas for other players. You, you are to write only one formula, and when you copy that formula, it's supposed to work for all players, no matter if you have five players or 300 players or 1,000 players, okay? So sit back, pause the video, write your formula, and then continue the video to see what the answer is. Okay, so obviously the formula is going to be $B$79, which is where the 5 is, times B2, which is the number of points, plus $C$79, which is where this 2 is, times C2. Okay, so if you put that formula here, and then you copy it for all others, then the B2 and C2 will change appropriately, depending on the row. But the $B$79, $C$79 will stay unchanged because they are absolute. Okay, one more practice problem. So here we are saying you've got some students, you've got their scores in the first two tests and the final. And we are saying the overall score for a student is computed as 0.25 times the score in test 1 plus 0.25 times the score in test 2 plus 0.5 times the score in test 3 or final, right? I should have said final here, okay? So that's what uh, the total score is. So once again, uh, of course, you've got the 0 0.25, 0 0.25, and 5 right here. So write a formula in E2 to calculate the total score, overall score for this student, the student on row 2. Once again, pause the video, continue it, once, you, once you've determined an answer, then you can continue the video to check whether your answer was correct or wrong. Okay, so it's quite easy. So write a formula for E2 that can be copied for all other students. So clearly the answer is going to be $B$14 times B2, right? So $B$14 has this 0.25, $C$14 has this 0.25, and dollar $D$14 dollar has the 0.5. And we are multiplying by B2, C2, and D2, which are all relative addresses. So you can put that address here. When you copy that, uh, that formula here, and when you copy that and paste it to all of these, the B2, C2, and D2 will change, but the $B$14, dollar $C$14, dollar $D$14 dollar 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 will remain unchanged, and it will be perfect. So that completes our discussion of absolute addresses. Now, we will discuss mixed addresses later on, but just a quick preview here. So, $B100, this is a mixed address, right? See, it's not that you've got only one dollar sign. I've got a dollar sign only before the column name, but not before the row number. What this says is the column is absolute, the row is relative. Okay, the column is absolute, the row is relative, which means that when you copy and paste this, the column will remain as B because it's $B. Excel won't change that, but it'll change the row appropriately when you copy and paste it. And you can also have an address like B$100, in which case the row is absolute, column is relative. So when you copy and paste, the column will change. Okay, we'll explore these later on. And uh, to understand the context in which these are required, again, don't worry about it for now. Uh, we'll explore these things later on in a separate uh, lecture altogether, right? Uh, for the most part, if you understand relative and absolute addresses, you can get by. Like I said, 80%, 90% of your designer spreadsheets will already be accounted for by just those two types of addresses. But there are some scenarios in which mixed addresses are extraordinarily useful. So we'll look at those scenarios later on.